welcome everybody to Scaling Data Science in Utah State Data Science Education Summit. My name is Wendy Steinley. I am the Chief Marketing Officer here at DOMO and I am thrilled to be with you today and to be joined by our partners at Women Tech Council, Utah Tech Leads, and Data Science for Everyone. So first of all, just a quick word for me. Why is it fitting to be here at DOMO? DOMO has been in the center of the data-driven world for over a decade. We put data to work for everyone so they can multiply their impact on the business, whatever their type of business industry or role. And data science is fundamental to how we help people do even more with data at scale. And um, in my time at DOMO and across other industries in Utah, I spent a lot of years at Adobe, at Deer Valley Resort, so it's not just a tech industry thing. I have seen our ability to gather, analyze, and translate data into meaningful, actionable outcomes just skyrocket. And really, never more so than today, because artificial intelligence plus data is powering new curiosity, new possibilities and new expectations. And that means that data and data science skills are getting more vital by the day for both our current workforce and K through 12 students who are going to be our workers of tomorrow. So I'm excited to be here with you all today, fellow data enthusiasts who know how critically important this is so that we as the state of Utah can be bringing the right programs for these students so that they can power our industries moving forward. And our opening keynote speaker today, I'm really thrilled to introduce her, is Sydney Tetro, the CEO of Brandless and founder and president of Women Tech Council. She has experiences ranging from Disney, Adobe, and beyond. I have had the chance to know and, and be inspired by Sydney for years, and she is an innovator, a growth leader, a technologist, a STEM advocate, an author, and a speaker. So please join me in wel welcoming Sid to the stage. I think they told me I could steal this one. Perfect. Um, thank you, Wendy. And I'm super excited to be here. Lots of times I get to talk just business. Today I get to talk some more of the of the tech side for just a moment and, and give some context about industry and data as we lead into the conversation today about how that's playing into education. So I did my undergrad in computer science. Now data science was not a thing when I came through. It was not a degree. Um, but I've had this opportunity to build my entire career grounded in technology and thinking about how innovation and technology really propels businesses. And when I think about technology I, or about data, I think of it as the language of business. So you think about this transformation that's happened in industry, particularly over the last decade, but even far reaching that. What data is for our organizations is it's the way we make decisions. The better insights that we have, the better knowledge that we have, the better ways we understand our customers and our markets. Like data is the foundation of everything that we do. It's like Wendy said, I mean, Domo is built on that, but our businesses are. And for me, it is one of those tools that has become vital. One of the other really interesting things is not just from the business per perspective, but I happen to also with the Women Tech Council get to be part of the SheTech program that we've created. We've had about 35,000 high school girls come through this program, about 3,000 girls annually. And what I love about the program is not just the girls, but the insights that you gain from how they're thinking about the world and how we can inspire them into other educational pursuits. One of the most fascinating things what you learn from all of these um, girls that we get to work with is how they too start to think about data. For some reason, they love data science. I can't tell you how many conversations we have with the young girls far more about data science than we do about computer science. Just think about that. If it's the language of business, if it's this way to unlock other talent and potential, it's not just true for the young women that we work with, but this entire generation coming up because we're teaching them more and more to ask questions. We're teaching them to ask deep questions about why things are happening and how the world is working. And data science is just the core of this. And for me, in building my career, it has been fundamental to every stage that I've been able to build. I really liked this translation too, is that data is this tool for enhancing intuition. 
a lot of times, and we've all been in meetings, you'll walk in a meeting and someone will have just gotten off with a customer and then that becomes the crux of the conversation. People will be like, okay, so-and-so just yelled at us and they're totally telling us to change everything and people react. But the reality is the data grounds you. The data takes the things that you hear and it actually tells you where you should spend time, how you should manage risk, and how you build real businesses. I mean, in my world today, everything is about data. So at Brandless, we're a curated wellness platform. We have both technology underneath that, and we've also acquired six companies over the last 24 months. So if you just think about the complexity of buying all of those companies, driving revenue, driving channels, like all of the things that I'm faced with in building a company, one of the things that we have learned is that data is the very first thing that we go with every time. The week after we buy someone, I put a data dashboard on them every time. I put the leading and lagging insights around them. I ask them those questions, why? I make everyone in the business start thinking about how data becomes the language that we can all agree to. It's no longer driven by emotions, it's driven by data. And if us in industry are thinking so deeply about how we use information to make decisions, how critical is it then for our next generation to also be grounded in the same things? And there's a creativity and an innovation part of data and insights. It's also one of the first people that I always hire into. Like, okay, gotta have someone who's building data and insights and who's thinking about that. The other really cool thing that I've seen happen as we've acquired these companies is I have a really big pool of associates who are college students who are studying a wide variety of things. A number of them have pathwayed into data science because not only do we give them exposure to data, but they get exposure on the back end of how you build those systems and build the dashboards and the insights. And the more that we're starting to train our next generation, the better they are at helping us understand business and, how, and, um, and all the things. The, for me, the thing that I love most about the data science world is it lets you ask the question why all the time. And so when you're in those meetings, it's like, what does that data tell us? What are we looking for? When you think about the, re the power behind education, it's the power in teaching people how to learn. It's the power in teaching people how to problem solve. And when you have very logical and discrete thinking, you can combine that with creativity to solve really interesting problems. The better we understand information around us and what the world looks like, the better we actually solve the big problems that we're faced with. The better we make trade-offs, the better we manage risk, the better we put our resources towards the things that matter most with the greatest impact. And for me, that has been my entire career. So I've had an opportunity to do lots of things. I spent just under six years at Disney, but when I left Disney, I created a 3D printing company where we could make you Iron Man. And it was a super fun company to build. I'll probably never get to like work with Iron Man and Marvel and Star Wars and all the sports guys ever again. But data was also at the foundation of this. I mean, we're building you know, 3D personalization platforms of scanning faces and combining those with posable action figures. But at the core of how we decided where we should go, where we should spend our time, what our opportunity looked like, was all of the insights and data that we could possibly find that helped us solve the problems. It was how was conversion looking. It was the insights from customers. It were the they were the places where our margin was the best or we could create scalability. The better we teach the people around us and our students how to look at this information and how to build and solve problems in really fun ways like entertainment and in really sophisticated and hard ways like things that are challenging us in um, to the challenges that the world faces from poverty to climate change, all of those things they have to have the questions of why, and we have to have the data to know where, if we spend our time here, we get a return in the short term, and then this return in the longer term. I think data science education is at the, really at the very beginning. I think it's so awesome that we get to forge new paths of innovation. I think it expands and opens up technology to more people in more ways, and lets us use the tools and, um, let's just use their talent in ways they might never have thought possible. Because I promise you, I already know not everyone's gonna go get a computer science degree. Like, I wish they would, but they aren't. And so then when you think about how technology looks today versus when I graduated a long time ago, we now have all of these other disciplines. We have everything from information systems to cybersecurity to user experience. But what data science is, it's this next wave that unlocks so much critical thinking and so many opportunities that I really don't think we can do unless we put formal disciplines behind it. The other thing that I know, right, is just not only do we have to create data, 
but that it is the thing that will create more opportunity for all of these other students as we go into the future. I think it increases our number of students in technology. I think it creates pathways where people haven't been able to see themselves before. And I think the more that we map it to what industry is looking, the better we actually enable our students to be prepared for the future of tomorrow. We all know AI, deep technology, is part of the world we're growing up in. And the more that our education system embraces pathways for everyone to have exposure to it. I mean, I love the fact that everyone has to take a CTE course to build a website. But you know what? That in and of itself doesn't inspire everyone to be a technologist. But the more opportunities we give them to expand their thinking into other disciplines, data being one of them, the more that they can see whatever they're interested in has an opportunity to influence that. During my time at Disney, we often used this as our slogan, that we were the science behind the magic because my job was innovation. My job was technology that was going to transform the future. And that is true for everything in technology. It is the science that we need in order to drive innovation and to drive change and to drive opportunity. And so as you're thinking about pathways that we create for education and this opportunity, it is very real. And the more that we think about how we expose our students to this, the better we will prepare them for the future. It's also true that for our students to embrace ideas like data science, they need mentors and role models. So circling back to my SheTech girls that I love, the thing that we know about them is the change for them is when they find role models and mentors. And they can see themselves in pathways that they've never been exposed to before. So I think we're not only faced with what's the curriculum that we create, but it's what's the entire ecosystem that shows them what's possible and shows them that there are people who have been there before that they can aspire to be so that they will embrace the opportunity that they have through the power of education in order to become the conduit for change for the future. And I think that's the opportunity in front of all of you. I think it's what we're trying to change. And I think it's what we should do as a collective system to make a very big difference for all of the students that we get an opportunity to work with. I think you're going to have a great day as you learn from so many different people in industry and from education. And I do think it's the collective resource of all of us working together that will create change for the students in the next generation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sydney, for laying that foundation of how data science really is the base that we need for all kinds of other innovation. And now what I'd like to do is invite our first panel up, highlighting the role of data science in um, industry across Utah. Our moderator will be Mark Mon of Domo, Chief Analytics Officer and Senior Vice President of Customer Success. He will be joined by Amy Heinrich, Vice President of Data at Pluralsight. Anna Bell, PhD Research Assistant at the University of Utah, and Joanna Fankhauser, Senior Vice President of Global Business Intelligence and Operations at Instructure. So let's give them a round of applause and welcome them to the front. We'll figure this out. We got green lights on our mics. Okay. No. 203. Hello. There you are. Yep. Um, I'm excited for this panel. So a little bit of a, a brief introduction of myself. Like Wendy said, I'm Mark Mon. I am Chief Analytics Officer here at Domo. I've held that role for about five years and recently took on the responsibility of our customer success team as well. So anything post-sales is in, in my world as well. When Wendy approached me about doing this, I was excited. Uh, you know, the Women in Tech Council uh, partnership in this event, I think, is incredibly important and excited to talk about data science and data. Uh, I'm excited to have a bunch of fellow data geeks and nerds and enthusiasts and whatever you want to call yourselves here in the room with me. Sometimes I geek out on this stuff and people are like, you're a weirdo. But sometimes they get it, and uh, hopefully you all get it. So I'm excited to be here with you. Um, why don't we do uh, some introductions? If uh, why don't we name the organization you're with, and um, we'll we'll start there. I'll hand that to you. I'm Annabelle. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Utah. Hi everyone. I'm Amy Heinrich. I work at Pluralsight. I'm VP of Data. 
I support uh, marketing, sales, customer success teams, uh, and have all kinds of data roles under me, including data science, um, analytics engineering, data governance, and data architecture. Thanks. Uh, Joanna Fankhauser, I'm a senior vice president and in instructor. Uh, leading strategic operations and intelligence, and that encompasses all of our internal systems, our internal intelligence as well, and that covers all of the go-to-market from sales, marketing, uh, customer experience, and as well as supporting product and engineering. Uh, thanks all for joining us. Uh, so we'll just start off uh, talking, we heard a little bit earlier uh, the conversation around data-driven decisions. And uh, we talk about this a lot at Domo. How do you make data-driven data decisions or data-based decisions? And what's the importance of that? I'd love to just talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, get a sense of what's been your experience in making data-driven decisions? What's the value of that? And, you know, whoever wants to take it, I'll let you, let you take it. You can fight for it. Yeah, I'll kick it off. Um, so, it was, it's been interesting. I've been an instructor for six years, which I feel like in tech is probably 50 years. <laughs> it, um, but in structure, we have this, this great opportunity to not only have this experience with leveraging, um, leveraging intelligence from the education market with the teams that we bring on, um, but also working, we have our, one of our main products is Canvas. So we see so much of what's going on in education in the state, which is, and globally, which is fascinating. There's 30 million students globally. But, you know, it's, it's been such a fascinating transition, specifically in the how, my, how quickly it's changing. I don't think I've ever seen this at any other point in my career. All these things that were theoretical for so long are now actually coming to fruition. And, and I still think at the crux of it, you know, there's this fear around it, but at the crux of it, what is really needed, no matter, like the volume is so much that I still reinforce with my teams every day that if you can't communicate this vast amount of data in a way that is consumable by the people that are making decisions, there actually still is no impact. So that level, and I love how Sid put it, that level of translating the volume of data that we're seeing to those that are making the decisions is still, um, in my opinion, where the value lies um, in the vast amount of data that we're seeing come in. Yeah, I agree with that completely. And I also really related with what Sid has said about um, that it shouldn't be emotional. You know, we're making decisions based on data and it's just presenting itself in a way that um, especially if it's connected to your business outcome that you are that you care about so much, it should be something that you can take and, and use. And, and that's part of what um, my job is, is to really make sure that I'm trying to answer those business questions with the most relevant data possible that really does speak to those, um, to those business objectives. And if it's doing that, and it's, and it's presenting itself in a way that, that's connect, making that connection, then I think leaders need to um, be willing to accept that that data for their decision support. I like what's being said, and um, I, I think there's an interesting perspective that I've had coming from the education system, right as it is right now. Um, I've participated in a lot of multidisciplinary projects, from um, human computer interaction to chemistry, and currently a civil engineering. And something that um, Jim Gray pointed out. Uh, maybe about 20 years ago, was that data science was a new paradigm of science. And I think what one of his, his major points was that it's a data first sort of science. And it's we've always started with data. It's just that right now, we have so much of it that we really have to start with it first. Um, and this is why it's important to have data scientists that are interacting with domain specialists. And on another point I wanted to make was that one reason why I found data science interesting, one thing that I've tried to um, really emphasize when I've interacted with students at like the SheTech um, Explorer Day is how domain specialists are relevant for data science, how the data is about something. And so you can be a traditional data scientist, but you can also participate in this movement 
through your interests. And I think that's a really great hook for a lot of students. Mm -hmm. For sure. I think one of the things that's interesting too is communicating through data is a, it's a two-way communication like any other communication. You've got the piece of how you uh, project that data or provide that information and how that information is received. Any tips or tricks that, that you would suggest to anyone um, in the field of how do you make data comprehensible, usable, actionable? Any thoughts? Oh, sure, I'll go. Um, the way you make it actionable and usable is really connecting at the operations level from a business standpoint anyway, I think. If you aren't working with operations teams in order to implement the data insights into whatever tools they're using, I just don't think it's gonna be uh, used as easily. So it's actually the value that makes it so uh, important actually is, is when it gets implemented by those who can use it on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, one of the, um, you know, we used to joke when, when the teams would come in and it would just be like a dueling dashboards conversation is what we called it. Everyone came in with what they wanted to prove and the data to back it up. One of the things that we implemented at Instructure, because in a way, you know, having a data team, having an ops team that's isolated, it's a bit of Switzerland, right? You come in, we have, because we're big Lord of the Rings fans, we have what is our single source of truth, which is our one ring. And it has all of this proven, validated data that we use to make calls within within the company. And that that really eliminates a whole lot of the back and forth with the with the dueling dashboard scenario and allows us to make the impact. But I love what you said, Anna, in regards to, you know, the closer you can get the data teams to the field. For so long, we would work with, um, you know, we will pull in a lot of data science for our interns. And we just finished the summer intern program. So this is um, recent in my memory, but they presented yesterday on their projects and you can tell the you can tell the teams that got really embedded with the teams they're supporting because they were really looking to find like what problems are we trying to solve because a lot of times when you just swim in the volumes of data you'll come out of it and i've done this myself many a times you'll come out of it with you know in like completely right field but really looking at what are we trying to solve, what questions are we trying to answer, the more you can tie them in the field, to your point, the more operationally impact you can make. I like what, yeah, I think um, you, you bring to mind a case study from IBM where they talked about their AI development team and how they interacted with stakeholders and how there was a really important data science role in the stakeholder team that had mostly to do with the maintenance of whatever the software it was that they're trying to develop and defining those questions mm -hmm. and especially um, making sure that the data that they were using was good because whatever you put in is going to probably determine the quality of what you get out. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd love to talk a little bit about where we've come from and where we think we're going. So maybe we start with where, where we came from. I'd just be interested to hear when do you first remember hearing about data and analytics in your life or your careers? And um, you know, when, when did that become a major part of your role or your function at each of your jobs? I can start. Um, data science didn't exist when I was in high school. Uh, I graduated in 2013, and I had Algebra 1 as my highest education in math. Um, it took many years of exploring, including uh, playing the glockenspiel on the street for tips. Um, and mm -hmm. I, uh, I took my first coding class in 2019, and I didn't know what coding was. But um, what I realized was the interest that I had in my previous studies was actually research. I was studying ancient astronomy. And um, when I learned about data science and I took my first data analytics class, I realized that what I really loved was research. And I think this is what's given me insights on how to maybe talk to younger people about data science in general, is that I realized that data science wasn't just a, you know, a technical skill set. It was something, it was a way of approaching the world. And um, I love it. I'm 28 now, four years, and <laughs> super stoked to be in, in STEM. Sorry, I'm stealing this back. I'm commandeering. 
Um, any, any other thoughts there? I'd love to hear where, where your journey with data started. Joanna? Yeah, um, you know, I love that you say um, that is so recent. Like, mm -hmm. back for, yeah, rewind even 20 years before that. My, my background, my undergrad, was in accounting. I always knew I liked, you know, the stability, I would call it, of numbers. I like the predictability. Um, and, and one thing that I continually reinforce with my team, we actually have a program at Instructure called Returnships. Um, for people that have been out of you know, their career, their professional outside the home career for a long time, and they want to jump back in and see what, the, um, see what the opportunities are. And that's what we leverage our returnship for. But I think that the wild thing about how quickly things are changing now is it's a double-edged sword. You can, you, if you don't continue learning, you become irrelevant really quickly right now. And if you, but the good news of that is, is if you do enjoy learning, you can get, you, know, you can find all these new avenues, this new um, passion and get up to speed without having, you know, 20, 30 years of experience under your belt. So I, I always laugh when we write these job descriptions and it's like 15 years experience. I'm like, that's hilarious. That didn't exist 15 years ago. So, so good luck with somebody who's made up a resume on that one. <laughs> but, um, but that really is, so my, my history has bounced all over the place from accounting, but it's always been based in this. I think as long as you find the crux of what am I trying to solve and how can I solve it, and you're willing to always learn, you can find a lot of different avenues into this world. I agree. Um, mine might be a little different. I did study math in my undergrad, and my first job coming out of college was as a forecast analyst, and I was doing, uh, you know, creating forecasts for a sales team, and, and I think it's like, I think I created like a small data regression model. You know, I, I felt like I loved the subject, but it was not really a, a field yet for sure. But I became a data scientist in 2015 after many years in different positions and going back for my master's degree and, um, and I love it. So I, I agree like the, having experience in any field I think helps because of the domain experience that's so applicable to solving these problems. and. Um, I love seeing the range of uh, backgrounds from people that we hire and also who we interview. And you can just tell there's interest in the subject from lots of different areas. And I think it's a great thing about the field. Yeah, my, my journey started in the operations space. It was, hey, we need to make better decisions. How do we do that? Then that drove to, to the use of data. I too graduated high school in 2013, so um, I, I did not. Um, <laughs> But no, in, in all seriousness, there, there is this component of data plus operations, and I think those two things marry together quite well. I, I'd love to talk about the future and where do we think the use of data, data science is going to go. Any, any thoughts there from you all? Um, uh, I think, at least from my perspective and what I'm seeing in academia is that data science is going to touch basically every subject. I like to joke that it's also going to touch dance, and it, it probably will. Um, and I think that's because it's really how we can approach the world in a, in a broader way, and um, in maybe even a more honest way. Um, but I think what challenges come up with this um, are primarily how do we communicate with domain specialists and people who are more abstract you know, and theoretical, like a data scientist who doesn't specialize in um, human-computer interaction or something like that. And also ethics, which has been a huge topic this year, especially with ChatGPT. I think interacting with the public and also having a say in how things are done, I think is going to become very important. And so I think data science ethicists and people who can um, not only help shape policy, but also be consultants for businesses and government entities is going to be a, a really big um, change that we're going to see in the next 10 years. I think we'll see more and more data professionals. It's my experience I've seen um, those who don't have a data background, I think, struggle in a lot of roles. Just in any role in business, if you have some data experience, you know how to apply it to your work. and. And there really does, um, 
really does stand out if you're not sure what to do with data. So that's, I think, important in this conversation about education, just how everybody can get a little bit more exposure for their own career success. And, um, and then I think we'll see that grow. We'll see more and more people who are used to using it, who want to use it, and who are willing to um, make decisions with it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I do think that how when you talk about the ethics of data, that is something that cannot be undervalued. I, I really think that companies, like this is going to yield a lot of, um, a lot of insight and and a lot of power going forward and i do think that making sure that from an individual that's learning this all the way up to how companies are leveraging it i do really appreciate conversations about what is the north star because i do think that companies that don't identify that can go can find themselves off of the path i you know one of the one of the early indicators because we see so much of it in education being it in structure of how people are leveraging chat gpt in many different ways and so there was a really involved conversation early on about you know how do we want to leverage this whether it be internally or supporting all these institutions and it really came down to the crux of the teacher is still the center and how do we enable the teacher with, you know, how do we take off the administrative tasks that we can work to automate? From an internal aspect, it was really from an aspect of how do we improve the experience of our customers? And I like those North Stars because for us that determined a whole lot of direction of how we leverage the resources internally. And I think that if a company, you know, that has a lot of data, which every all the companies, right, we're building so much data infrastructure. If we don't have those North Stars, then I can see how we'll go sideways. So I'm really hoping that the leaders that are coming into all these companies are really looking at it with that lens in mind of, of, of how are you going to, what is that North Star that you're driving to, to answer? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you referenced a couple of times ChatGPT. Um, this connective tissue between data and AI. Um, obviously, AI is driven by data, so we know that there's that foundational piece of it. And um, without that data you're, you, and, and the training of, of AI, you, you don't get anywhere. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out over time. Are any of you using AI at all in, in your roles today? Have you found places where you can use it and feel like ethically you can use it? I have. I've used it for writing. I love um, arguing with ChatGPT. I like to say, you know, what, what are some of the holes in my in my thinking here? What are some arguments that, you know, or critiques that I might encounter in something that I'm writing? And it's actually really useful because I don't have to, you know, catch anybody up on what I'm what I'm trying to write about. That doesn't mean that it's always, you know, perfect. But it's it's more than just talking to myself. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we've built some deep learning models, not necessarily always language-based, but um, some deep learning models on the where we have enough data and enough variables, where it makes sense to do that on the business side. But certainly in the product for Pluralsight itself, that's a topic that's being discussed quite a lot. It's a, it's a hot topic that we are um, certainly researching as well. Um, so yeah, absolutely, where it makes sense to do it, uh, a deep learning model, um, for sure can can bring improvements. Yeah, we've we've largely used it um, internally for our internal operational use cases. We're we're very careful to to actually because of because of the um, users not use it in regards to product etc. But from an internal standpoint, we use it all the time. Like, you know, I I think of it akin to um, the calculator. Right. Um, we used to have all of this really manual exercise when we do UAT system production deployment for our internal revenue systems. A ton of that now can be um, can be automated, and it never ceases to to amaze me when I see when I saw the you know 23 summer intern class come through and how they were leveraging it. I thought. I am so glad I'm not competing against you kids now. <laughs> they're they're just phenomenal. But um, but yeah, we we leverage it all the time. 
specifically largely in um, UAT of coding. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of organizations are trying to build AI into their products and provide an easier user interface for individuals within their products. We're doing that at Domo as well. We have an, our, our product can be infinitely customizable. We have a thing called Beast Modes, which is essentially SQL, you can write SQL code to customize your, your uh, visualizations. And so we're right now working on a um, AI assistant for writing that, that coding. Right now, it's quite difficult. You have to be quite technical to do it, um, but you know, by opening up, by leveraging AI, we can open that up to, to more users. So it's always interesting to me just to hear how people are thinking about it. Another way that we're using it is just in summarization of calls. Uh, uh, running CS, you know, 200 people in that org, uh, we, we capture our customer calls and our prospect calls and um, I have somebody on my team that listens to recorded calls before bed, not to go to sleep, but to calm themselves down from the day, which is weird. But um, for me, I don't enjoy that. I would rather just have a summary. So I asked my team if they could use um, some of the existing tools to summarize calls for me. And it's been actually quite, quite helpful. Obviously, the challenge we have with all of this is you're plugging data into a model and there's always the questions of how can that data be used outside of that model for other organizations and always has to be considered. So I'm going to go off script and I'd like to get personal. I'm just kidding. It's on the script. I'm supposed to get personal. So I, did I scare you? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Who was your first kiss? Just kidding. Um, so I, I just like to talk about personal past because I think this is interesting. We talked a little bit about like where where our first experience was with data, but how has that evolved for each of you? And over time, where like where has data proven uh, valuable in each of your um, in each of your roles? Uh, I'd, I'd love to just chat a little bit about that. I think it's always interesting to to understand the paths of others so that as we're considering new paths or where we want to go, how other people got to where they got to. So Anna, um, you know, obviously you're, you're young in, in your career and from a, a, an education perspective, but anything that you would add there first? Sure. Um, so, I mean, it's, if it's from a personal perspective, something I really like about data science is how it's bridged my very um, impractical but passionate um, learning in my early, you know, like late teens, early 20s when I studied the history of astronomy. It's all ancient Greek geometry stuff. Nobody, nobody does that anymore. But it was uh, very fascinating to me to see the progression and, um, you know, Jim Gray, I brought Jim Gray up earlier. When he talked about data science and this rise of this new paradigm, he brought up astronomy because in astronomy we have these huge data sets that just take, you know, terabytes to take just a photo of the entire night sky for one night, right? Um, and so seeing the way that people have learned to use data from 3,000 years ago up to now, it's, it's really been, you know, us looking up at the stars. So personally, it's kind of wrapped my a little bow around my education. Um, but also it's, it's challenged me in understanding um, why I make decisions and the way that I structure my intuition because I, I know how limited certain fields are when it comes to the data they have access to. I work with very tiny data sets sometimes. Um, and that is my personal life and also in academia. Any other thoughts on, on your past and data and how that's played? I think that you know my path has evolved so much from from having many more years of, <laughs> of time spent in the working world. Um, the, the one thing I would say is, you know, one thing I've always done, and I gave this advice to the interns this year, is, is tie your passion, tie your career to the problems you're trying to solve. Like, there will always be problems to solve. People get fearful when they tie their career, their path to a specific technology. Right, if you're getting tied to, and not saying that these specific ones will go away, but if you're getting tied to SQL and you're getting tied to Python, and those are now being automated through AI, like that's going to instill fear. But if what you're saying is, I am going to use data to solve problems, I'm going to use data to 
you know, like increased my interest in astrology. Like there's so many, astronomy, uh, <laughs> um, there's so many different avenues that you can leverage. And so I think that for me, that that's my North Star, right? Like how am I going to leverage whatever technology it may be to solve problems? And then you can always, there will always be that opportunity. I love that, that's good. I, um, I think for me personally, I've, things have changed for me the past couple of years. I've been leading different data teams than uh, other than data science. So I feel like I've been learning a lot about the other, um, you know, the infrastructure or governance of data. And that's been pretty fascinating to me. I think like in addition where, um, you know, getting into different industries or thinking about ways you can apply your skills in a different setting is always important. And, and of course, data translates so well. So yeah, absolutely. How do I, I use data all the time in my personal life and uh, professional life. And I think I will continue to. So I know there was a slip of the tongue with the astrology and astronomy, <laughs> but I just wanted to say um, there's actually a really fun connection there, which is that astrology usually, um, the data that we use is where the sun is relative to the stars, right? And that is the perspective that we have naturally. Um, we don't get to see the earth from the outside, right? Um, and so sometimes I've, I've thought about trying to reverse engineer uh, what Kepler did, just to, just to see how, how do you get from this perspective to the one that we have now just from data. And I think that that is something really beautiful about data science and about the history of science, is that this is what we do with data, is we learn how to make sense of things, even if it doesn't actually make sense from where we're standing, right? Mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't see the solar system. We just know because it makes sense, because our models make the most sense that way. Yeah, that's very nice. I'm gonna pick your brain on that later. <laughs> um, I know we have educators here, and I, I, I just like to talk about that piece of, of data science. Uh, you know, I had a conversation recently with a customer, and we were talking about the ages of our kids and you know where they're headed into college. And, and one of the data professionals I was talking to said that he, his son said, well, what, what field should I go into where I can make the most money? Mm -hmm. and, and his dad said, in, into data science. Um, and I thought that was an interesting answer. We talked a, a little bit about it, but you know, students that are, you know, I guess from a hiring perspective or, or as a student, what kind of skill sets do we think would be helpful coming out of school? Um, you know, Joanna, you mentioned with AI and, and the shift of what are we, what's, it, what's the future going to look like for, for uh, students? I'd love to just talk a little bit about what skill sets do we think are universal that will be helpful that we've seen as we've hired folks into our organizations have been helpful? Any thoughts there? And, and also would love to hear, Anna, just how you've seen your, your education specifically uh, be helpful for you. One of the leading both sides of the coin, I think from an operations and the um, data aspect the number one question I have my team go into is like, when they're talking with these field leaders, is what problems are you trying to solve, right? I, I used to joke with our head of revenue that I was gonna take away his dashboard and just give him like a smiley face or a sad face, because that's what it boiled down to. He's like, just tell me what it's telling me. And I realized that when Sid talks about the translators, that for me is actually the ideal scenario is, somebody who can take this vast amount of knowledge. I think that that's where, from my perspective, the value lies, is, is no matter how complex the model is, being able to boil it down to what we call it in structure, the TLDR, like too long, don't read. Like, here's your three bullet points of how you can dramatically impact your business. Like, that is, in my opinion, like going to, gonna still be continually, no matter what happens with data, the most valuable skill set. I totally agree with that. I think all educators should be thinking about, um, you know, n now how do we tell that story and, and explain it well and translate it? Um, and then starting out in that process though, I think getting creative with data. So when we see applicants, I like to ask them lots of questions about, um, the domain space and how they think about the, the problem and what kind of variables they would create when they're thinking about models and uh, the creativity in data instead of just taking a data set and, 
and working on a problem with it, maybe the extending it to creating new information uh, with that data, I think is would be a valuable experience for students. I love that. And I actually think um, for me, if I were to, you know, be in high school now, if someone were to tell me that any of my interests could be, you know, important in some sort of data science project, I'd be much more interested in math and science. Mm -hmm. um, because mm -hmm. for me, I had a lot of interests, they just weren't really relevant to anything. <laughs> and um, I, I think I think understanding the data itself, like you were mentioning, is really an interesting question. And it also helps it helps us understand the nature of our interests as well, which can help students make decisions. Um, at the University of Utah, we have programs for a lot of um, different demographics and accessibility from you know boot camps for data analytics up to you know PhD programs and we have an undergraduate program in data science but something that we're working on um, at the College of Engineering and also just internally um, within you know the data science community at the U is how do we how do we reach young people and I think another point um, that should be emphasized that Sid brought up earlier is seeing people that you can relate to because you can see yourself when you see other people doing something that you think you might be interested in. Yeah, yeah, I think it's interesting you go, oh, that, I like that. That's something maybe I could do. Well, thank you so much for your answers. We wanted to open it up to the, the audience for any q and I will be the microphone uh, runner. If you have any questions, just raise your hand and um, you can see how fast I can run. Don't all raise your hand at once. That was fast, right? <laughs> Thank you very much. It was so nice to listen to you. And congratulations. You are doing a great job. Uh, my question is for, I know some question was for the youth. In my case, I have a program for Latinos, and it's youth from seven. Uh, what kind of ideas, what kind of recommendation you give me for interesting or try to uh, explore these ideas with them? Thank you. I think you should look at public data sets if you aren't already. There's, and there, you could just Google public data sets and you can get links to lots of different open free data sets and see what interests your class or what might interest the class. Um, and then think about what kind of questions you would ask about this. That's always where you're starting. So, you know, a lot of education data is open and, and you can see things, uh, of course, anonymized, but a lot of it's on the website and you can ask questions about the success of students or, or different variables that might be driving things. So you can think of questions based on open data, open data sets. That's what I would recommend. I, I think what you said is spot on with finding what, what sparks their level of interest. You know, I don't think that a lot of, a lot of what our, um, the kids interact with, they realize. I, She's gonna kill me, but I brought my 15-year-old daughter here today. And I always joke because Spotify, right? The end of year release where they're like, you're in the top 1% of Taylor Swift Spotify listeners. And I'm like, okay, if that's top 1%, how long did you spend on Taylor Swift? Like, let's back into that number. And of course you get the eye rolls and everything, but I think it's always that. It's letting them see that this is pervasive everywhere and let's strike the interest like, how many Swifties did it take to take down Ticketmaster, right? Let's like think about this. And you ha start having these conversations with the things that apply to their world. And all of a sudden they realize like, oh, this is, this is so interesting. And, and it's fun to see the competitions that take place even within the intern teams of leveraging data that they didn't even really think was actually a data problem. Yeah, I really appreciate you guys being here and explaining to us the uh, the role of the data scientists and the companies that you work with and how that impacts you. One of the things, I'm an educator for the last 30 years, and one of the things that I've struggled with with my students for years is they think of math as just numbers. Well, yeah, it's data, right? 
And uh, this idea of data science and looking at data, uh, one of the things that you're pointing out now as a skill set is communication, right? And being able to interact with other people, different domains, different areas. How do you teach that? Because one of the things I've struggled with over the years as well is I teach stats, right? And yes, you do some communication there, but this is like next level communication, right? What, what are some strategies do you think you can help us with as educators uh, in the classroom to kind of develop that skill of communication and summarizing and everything that you guys do? Oh, please. Um, Something that I found to be really fun and effective is trying to give a spatial representation of what's going on. So for a linear regression model, um, you can first of all make very provocative predictions that can engage students, you know, predict whether or not they're going to be an engineer and ask them whether the questions they were asked and what the coefficients are in that linear regression model, model are fair. But also having those coefficients be not numbers, having them be like bars and histogram or something like this um, and let them toggle with it. Um, I've, I've found that it's a lot more engaging and you know, uh, I'm taking a data viz class right now and one of the big things is trying to remove numbers as much as possible and give a more spatial um, intuition around data. I didn't like math because I thought it was all numbers too, so. <laughs> yeah, one thing I would say is we talk a lot about data storytelling. You know, we all relate in the world via stories. And so I tell my team, I ask my team often, what's the story you're trying to tell? And maybe that's the wrong wording, but essentially that's what I'm trying to get at. You've got this data, you have these answers, you've got this insight. How do you tell the best story to be able to inform the group that's receiving that story and be able to get the value from that story. So data storytelling, I like that wording because I think it's something that can apply. And if you can take any math or any you know data and tell a story around it, I think that's where the impact is. I love the term data storytelling because I think that's exactly spot on to what you're seeing if you want to drive actual impact. I think that um, stats was my favorite actually, so <laughs> props to stats teachers all over the world that can make it um, exciting and engaging. But I do wish that somebody early on in my, in my stats life would have said the number one thing universally that any conversation start out with is like, here is why you should care about what I'm about to say. Right? And, and the, I always tell my team, the higher you're going up in an organization, the briefer you have to be. Like if you're talking with the C-level, you better come in with the one sentence. Like that's the time you get, right? Because, um, because my team will come to me and they'll be so excited about regression analysis they're working on and all this stuff. And I'm like, nope, you come in with two sentences. This is why you should care and how it's gonna impact your business. And then they can run with it. But I wish that somebody would have told me that earlier on in my career, because I think that, you know, when I grew up, it was like minimum of 5,000 words in this. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, the actual value is the inverse of that. Like, if you can tell a story in two sentences, like, there's your power. For sure. That's exactly well, what I was going to say. Oh, sorry, edit. go ahead. I was just going to go say quickly. edit. Edit was my answer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> edit everything. Awesome. I'm sorry, we're, we're out of time, but I think we have a a break now. So first, uh, why don't you join me in giving a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you so much, Joanna, Anna, and Amy. Okay, so welcome back. The first half of our event focused on the foundation of data science and industry, and the second half is going to focus on education, including a spotlight of two data science advocates with deep ties to Utah and a panel of teachers from Utah's Data Science Education Pilot Program. And please make sure to stay through the end of the program to hear closing remarks from Utah State Representative Jefferson Moss. So for our next keynote, it is my pleasure to introduce two of the most important people in Utah's K through 12 educational landscape. It's Utah State Superintendent Sidney Dixon and Deputy Superintendent Patty Norman. Both Superintendent Dixon and Deputy Superintendent Norman have long-standing relationships with education in Utah. Superintendent Dixon has served the children of Utah for 42 years, beginning her career in a two-room schoolhouse in rural Utah. She has been the State Superintendent of Public Education since 2016. 
and Deputy Superintendent brings a similarly impressive list of credentials to the table. She began her teaching career 30 years ago and has been in and around the classroom ever since. Her roles have included serving as math supervisor, director of curriculum for Davis School District, and co-founding Utah Students Connect. Let's welcome them both with a warm round of applause. All right, which one should I talk through? <laughs> this one. All right. okay. um, it's great to be with you. Thanks for sticking around. Those were some lovely hors d'oeuvres, generally for those of us that are educators, not seen at most education convenings. So thank you to the sponsors for sharing those great hors d'oeuvres. And I love that we had the younger, cooler Sydney kick us off. Um, I thought to her, I just, it just felt like a really profound TED talk and then to roll into that great panel, really appreciated the words. And we thought we w might start with our story of mathematics. You're, you're gonna hear from some students who are the real reason we're here. Uh, but we thought we might share our stories as well. So um, I, as a child, was a lover of numbers. I was pretty good at math, just basic computation. And as a young child, I picked up mathematics pretty quickly. Uh, you heard in my introduction that I went to a two-room schoolhouse. My grandmother was my teacher when I was a, a child. And then as I evolved into um, high school, I had a little bit different experience. But as a kid, I was really curious about the world. I was a lover of nature, I was out and about, always observing the world around me, and I really loved mystery. So Nancy Drew was my go-to gal. I just couldn't wait till the bookmobile showed up. If those of you who don't know what that is, you can Google it. Uh, but that was my library, and I couldn't wait for the latest Nancy Drew. Uh, and I would use data as I was reading to figure out what the end of the story might look like. Now, um, I wasn't into people like Ada Lovelace. Again, you can Google Ada, but she was an early pioneer of data science back in the, eight, I think the 1800s. Um, and I was not drawn to people like that, but Nancy had my attention. Um, then as I, we moved to the big metropolis of St. George, Utah, when there were about 14,000 people in the entire county, and my math trajectory was not what I thought it should be. So. I was um, pigeonholed into some just very basic classes when I would go and ask the principal or the counselor if I could be advanced into classes that were more challenging. I was told, no, uh, you don't need those courses. In fact, I was, the phrase was used on me, you're a girl and you don't need those courses. So that was back in the 70s in small town Utah. Um, and so I was placed in courses that were just not challenging and would finish my work early on and was quite bored. And then when I got into college, um, and I was not a student that was expected to go to college, was not encouraged to go to college. When I got into college, again, I ended up with math teachers who just had to take on that extra course because they were a coach, or I just never really had that experience uh, of having the great math teachers that are here in our audience. So when I became a teacher, Part of it was I earned a master's degree and I had to have a tutor to pass the GRE and ended up with two master's degrees and a doctorate degree. So, you know, with the right tutoring, doesn't matter what stage it is in life, you can make it through. Um, however, I was t tasked with teaching math because I had a genuine love for numbers and a love for mathematics. And I taught upper elementary grades and I felt like such an imposter. I had kiddos in my class who were really accelerated and they wanted to go. And I thought back on my experience where I was held to a lower standard and, and held back from acceleration, and I did not want that for my students. So I made sure as a teacher that I tried to personalize their mathematic, uh, mathematics experience and to try and engage them in the things that they were interested in, which was often problem stories, uh, problem solving, creative thinking. We did a lot of inventions. I think I had the first invention convention in my classroom, um, just try to do anything I could to help them figure out how to use the data around them. So that's my math story. Dr. Norman, please share yours. Yes, um, thank you. So first of all, I would just want you to know that I'm trusting you with these pictures. This is the first time I have ever used these in any public setting. And I'll explain to you the significance. My husband and my children said, never, never, never show the picture that is on the left. And so I am showing it to you and only you, and I'm sure it's gonna stay in the safe space. 
face. So um, as you can see as a child, there's not a smile there, but it was because I was super shy, super, super shy. The kind where you'd come into a classroom and the teacher would be like, are you okay? And I'd be like, oh no, they're talking to me. And so you're just like, yeah, just stop talking to me and I'm gonna go sit down somewhere. And so as a child, I come from a family of intergenerational poverty and most of my family is still within intergenerational poverty. And I didn't have books in my home there unless that, that's a whole nother story. Um, and I learned to read late. But the one thing that I could do is memorize. And if you know how to memorize back in the day, so I'm 53 and I own every year, I'm so grateful I'm alive, so yes, yes, yes. Um, back in, in that time, if you were a good memorizer, you were a good student. As long as you could memorize memorization recitation, you were straight A's. And if you were quiet too, then you were a good student. And they often told me that she doesn't even speak at all. She's, she's just so sweet. That's an H, honors in citizenship. So I learned quite early that if you don't say a single thing and you just memorize, you're gonna do amazing things. Not true, absolutely not true. Scariest feeling in the world to come and be able to say, I love numbers. I loved that stability that Joanna talked about. I love that stability of being able to say, step one, step two, step three, and you're gonna get an answer. And as soon as you have the answer, you're done. And I was usually taught there was one way to get that answer. And the faster I did it, the smarter I was. And then as soon as I did it really, really fast, I got to do free time. Do whatever you want. I'm like, that's even better, right? I don't know who's lived through this experience. It might be just me. So when I needed to be challenged, no one recognized that. Because I could do those 30 problems and I could do them super fast and I knew a trick. And the trick was back in my day, they had those 30 those problems. And what was at the bottom of every worksheet? Like story problems. There's a trick, you guys know that trick, right? All you gotta do is go up to the teacher because they know you're sweet because you're quiet and you don't say anything. And you're like, now this one, I, I don't understand this one. Can you help me out? No, oh, just do this. Oh, just do that. Go back, memorization, recitation, done. Did I know what I was doing? Absolutely not. Could I use it any other way? Never. And then I got challenged by a teacher who made me think, scary, scary, scary. And I learned to have a voice and it was in mathematics. I was used to getting straight A's and the teacher was like, well, tell me if you use it differently. And I'm like, no, because wait, just tell me what to do differently and I'm more than happy to do that for you. I was a great follower. I could follow instructions and I could give you what you wanted, but I could not think for myself. And we are in a world today using data, using numbers, where these kids need to think for themselves. They need to be the creator of the information. So if we're going along this, I had to persevere out of necessity. And the reason why this picture means so much to me, I don't know that you can see it, the, the blonde hair kind of just really sticks out, but I have braces on. And that was like the one thing that I knew everyone with straight teeth had money. And so every picture you see up until then was not smiling with any teeth showing ever. And that picture means so much to me because it was a sign that I finally arrived. I could do this for myself. And then I became exuberant. I had my story, I could tell it, I could think for myself. Numbers played that story for me because I could speak to what needed to come next. And now I have that gratitude and that personal responsibility to be able to pay that forward, to thank that teacher that did that for me, that made me go outside of myself, to give me a voice to be able to speak on behalf of numbers or whatever else it was, to be the creator of my own destiny. So that's my journey in mathematics. So Dr. Norman and I have experiences that are not unlike many of the students in our classrooms today, but we both have shared goals when it comes to data science. So we wanna talk a little bit about those. I'm the person who still needs that narration and that interpretation that Sydney and Joanna talked about. Um, I want somebody to look at all of that uh, data and summarize it for me. I don't wanna go through a bunch of spreadsheets. Dr. Norman, on the other hand, sees a spreadsheet and her eyes light up. <laughs> she, her blood pressure rises because she gets really excited over spreadsheets. But given our, our different ways of approaching data, we are both very student-centered and data-informed. And that's the core of the way we go about our work. So um, we want to be 
transparent about what we're doing. We want the data to tell the story, but we want to make sure we have all of the relevant data and not just one piece of the story. We really believe that all students need very strong numeracy skills. We believe that that is critical. Um, and so we, we want our students to all be exposed to awesome teachers, teachers who not only know their content, but know how to teach it well. So that all of the panelists that were up here today talking about their journey of how they got into data science, that our students have their, their own journey of being able to access their future through effective math instruction. And we want our, stu our teachers to be confident and capable. Sometimes we say uh, perhaps that teachers just aren't willing or that they don't understand. And our experience is that they might be like I was as a young teacher where I felt like an imposter. Uh, where I felt like, I, I mean, I knew that I wasn't serving students well. In fact, um, those of you who know Phil Mickelson, even if you don't golf, you probably know who he is. His wife, Amy, was in my sixth grade class. And I had the opportunity many years ago, uh, she and Phil started a foundation, a, a STEM foundation for girls. And I had the opportunity to talk to her. And I felt so, I thought, oh my gosh, I hope she didn't start that because of her poor sixth grade instruction. <laughs> But she, she actually said to me, no, you were a teacher who really pushed me, nudged me, and let me um, accelerate ahead. And you made me excited about math and science. I taught both of those um, content areas. So after the whoosh, I still never let go of that imposter syndrome. So we want our teachers to be really confident and capable and get the kind of support they need in order to create classrooms where students can really thrive in mathematics. So where are we going, Dr. Norman? I love the question of where we're going. I love the panelists earlier this morning when we had Joanna, Amy, and Annabelle, and, and talking with Sid as well, because they focused on the where they are going within their own um, journeys, within their own lives, but both personally and professionally. So when we look at this first thing up here, this is kind of that other scary word, artificial intelligence, as though it is something new that just landed on this planet and today we're gonna start doing something called artificial intelligence. How long has it been around for? 20, 25, 30 years, right? I just went to a Google conference and when they started talking about what artificial intelligence is, I just want you all to be honest. You can close your eyes if you want to. Who's ever used word correction or spell check? Raise your hand, raise your hand. My goodness, you've all used artificial intelligence. You have. What about predictive text? Have you ever chosen the word that it chose for you when you started to write one and thought, oh, I would have said that if I would have thought of that word. Who's ever used that? Raise your hand. Congratulations, you've all used artificial intelligence. You are a consumer on a daily basis of artificial intelligence. It is not new. The only thing new about it is the fact that it now is in the hands of every single person. We all have access to it, equality. So there's an equity thing that is starting to occur with things like open chat GPT. And then there's things that are closed, more in the line of being able to like um, BART or whatever through a Google workspace, where then all of your data stays within. In chat GPT, it's open, everything goes out. So just remember that after you leave. So whatever you put in there is now open for everyone to use. It's this massive generator of data. It doesn't learn. That's a misconception, but what it does is it takes the data that's out there. So now as data scientists, everything we do is even more important. And the reason it's more important is because data is not just numbers. We heard that this morning, didn't we? It's not just numbers, it's experiential data. It's all the data that goes along. And we only have one more minute. So guess where else we're going? I could talk to you guys forever about where we're going. Um, really, it's in every subject. It's every single thing that we're doing in every single subject. It's embedded within everything that we're doing. And it's not just about artificial intelligence as technology. It's about how we communicate and how we ask questions. So we have a map uh, in our system. It's called the Portrait Graduate or Utah Talent Map. And we're about mastery of our content. We're about helping kids become lifelong learners, autonomous learners. And we want them to have purpose. And so we've created this aspirational document and about nine, over 90% of our districts and about a third of our charters are also creating their own journey of what they want their students to know and be able to do when they leave their systems. So um, 
just scooching through these, you'll see again, not just academic mastery, but notice digital literacy. What does that look like today? As Dr. Norman just talked about, it embeds more than, uh, than what we've been thinking about with digital literacy. So a lot of these things are changing and growing. And um, you, can't, you can't do the C's without having mastery of the academic. So these layered on top are things that you heard the panel talk about, and you'll hear our kiddos talk about these very same things. Um, having resilience and, and engaging in hard work in mathematics, if we could just get kids to persevere through some of the hard things that they're challenged by, um, that's something. So starting now, what are we doing, Dr. Norman? Yes, so starting now, it's everyone, it's everywhere. It's about putting the safeguards in place to protect our students and to protect our communities first. It's about looking at data as a tool to inform and making sure that we then ask the questions why. I know that was already stated. It tells the story, but making sure we're asking the right questions after we get it and before we get it as well to inform so that we're not using it um, in a way that is destructive as well. Doing math instead of just studying it. Isn't that awesome to be able to do it instead of just think that other people created this? We're the creators. Solving real challenges. They get to inform and do the challenges every single day. That's what data does. It's a data-rich environment that informs our instruction. And we like to say at the Utah State Board of Education that we are on the road to awesome. So when it comes to data science, we really see that in action and believe it. So congratulations to, to you educators and to our business partners who are really together in this journey. We're very excited about the way ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Superintendent Dixon and Deputy Superintendent Norman for sharing your stories, your vision of where we need to go and a fantastic path for a journey that we can all join you on. We're gonna spotlight now some additional data enthusiasts who both have educational ties to Utah. First, I'd like to introduce Daniel Weckler, Associate Data Scientist at NASA Ames Research Center. Before joining NASA, Daniel completed his undergraduate degree at Utah State University. After Daniel, we'll hear from Brendan Kelly, Director of Introductory Math at Harvard University with deep roots in Utah, including completing his PhD at the University of Utah. They're both thrilled to be back in the state with us for this event. Let's begin by welcoming NASA's Daniel Weckler. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thanks to the previous panelists for their stories. Those were really cool to listen to. Um, but yeah, as uh, as she said, I uh, my name is Daniel Weckler. I uh, work under KBR, uh, supporting the data science group at NASA Ames Research Center. Uh, now, despite not growing up in Utah, uh, I do have plenty of ties here. For example, I was born here. I think that's a pretty important tie here. Um, the other one is uh, my dad went to Utah State University, and both my grandparents went to Utah State University. So kind of figured I should continue that legacy. Um, and so I ended up getting my bachelor's degree in electrical engineering there. Um, now from there, I actually moved back to California and got my master's degree at San Jose State University. And through the San Jose State University Research Foundation, I ended up uh, getting an internship at NASA Ames. Uh, and after that, a full-time job uh, as a data scientist, uh, yeah, as a data scientist supporting the data science group there under KBR. Um, but yeah, data science wasn't even on my radar uh, when I went through uh, my, any of my university courses, much less high school. Uh, we were required to take several CS courses as part of an electrical engineering major, um, but the closest thing I took to any of that stuff was just the stats classes and then the programming classes that we were required. Um, but nothing really talked about like AI, data science, or anything like that. Um, basically, I even took enough CS to get a minor, and I didn't even know it was an option. I did look back at the academic catalog, though, and it, they did offer it. They did offer a neural networks class, but it was a 6,000 level course, which not that's usually graduate student level, and if you're just getting a minor in it, you're not going to take that class. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I had heard all the machine learning buzzwords, but I hadn't really known, didn't know much about it at all until I took a neural networks class uh, in grad school in 2017. Um, now, uh, data science is applicable to a wide variety of fields. 
so that in that class, uh, it was actually an electrical engineering course, uh, and we were meant to use it for signal processing. Um, and a lot of the data scientists in the data science group at NASA Ames come from uh, varied backgrounds as well, because again, uh, data science as a prof as, as like classes and stuff like that are still pretty new in terms of just like being adopted by the by the uh, wider audiences. Um, yeah, so we uh, we had electrical engineers, biological engineers, astrophysicists, uh, mechanical engineers, uh, software engineers, and yes, we did have someone that got their master's degree in data science as well. Um, but yeah, most of them didn't start with data science, but they used their unique backgrounds to uh, support the group's research. Um, and just for fun, here's a list of projects that the data science group has had their hands in. Uh, uh, first off is the, the Kepler slash TESS uh, exoplanet discovery work, which is finding uh, planets exterior from our solar system, many of which are not visible through telescopes. It's pretty cool, pretty cool work. Uh, the next one, if I can get my paper, uh, is aviation safety, which is what I work on. Um, and uh, basically we're uh, tasked with uh, figuring out how to define like airspace complexity, detect anomalies, and then do precursor detection, which is detecting possible bad things that could happen before they happen so that pilots can take corrective actions and yeah, not have near mi all these near misses you keep, might be seeing in the news now. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, there are other ones that did fault detection, which uh, was uh, done in some of the work on the International Space Station, uh, shuttle cryogenic fueling processes, uh, checking the health of the Hubble telescope, and uh, and then uh, some uh, some other minor ones, which is just like just text mining stuff, sentiment analysis on pilots, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, that's a, a lot of the cool work that is done at NASA Ames uh, uh, under the Data Science Group. Um, but yeah, while I re while I received a great education under USU's Department of Engineering, uh, as I said earlier, I wasn't really exposed to data science until I came back to Silicon Valley. So there are many aspects of my personal and professional life that I feel like would have been enhanced if I had earlier exposure to this. Uh, so it's really cool to see a lot of kids get, like kids and college students get like these opportunities. Um, I would have loved to work with image classification or object detection that, in my electrical engineering projects that just would have been really interesting and really cool to me. Um, um, let's see, where did I, I'm sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, machine learning and data science has kind of been uh, a, a, a bigger thing in modern day life. Like we have generative AI, which is like ChatGPT, uh, DALI, uh, Im and, image and stuff like image classification. You guys have probably seen, seen a lot of that and a lot of it has been discussed already today. Uh, so whether you plan on having a career in data science or just whether you plan on doing something else, it's important to know about it uh, and be familiar with how it works, like how models are trained, how much data goes into the models, and then one thing that I think is very important is ethics around it and ethical sourcing of data. Um, but yeah, early exposure to data science, such as through uh, the Utah's data science pilot program, can help with this understanding and help people decide their career paths uh, and also help understand how AI can impact you in your everyday life or even how to make a career out of it. Um, now, I was told to give some advice for uh, people uh, if they were starting off in data science. Now, the first thing is to have uh, strong computer science fundamentals. Uh, these are usually covered by your first two, uh, two called, oh, sorry, uh, the first two CS courses, and then um, uh, having strong Python fundamentals, uh, and then also, uh, yeah, uh, you, you want, sorry. Um, uh, basically, you, if, if you can take a course in it, you should. Uh, you should do some projects on your own if you can. And uh, I find that jumping in and making something exciting or useful has, from my experience, been the best way to learn stuff. Um, but yeah, uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce Brendan Kelly, uh, who's the Director of Introductory Math at Harvard University, to the stage. And uh, he has long-standing ties with Utah and is also a data science education advocate. Welcome him, and I'm sure he's a much better public speaker than I am. <laughs> it's so great to be here. Um, I was a PhD student at the University of Utah, and I also had a fellowship in undergraduate education. I taught for many years at the University of Utah, and it's always so great to be back. As an educator, 
I really want to highlight what my North Star is. I like Joanna's framing of thinking about what our North Star is. And my North Star is empowering young people, helping them build the quantitative tools that help them step up to their interests and aspirations. And as a calculus teacher, that is challenging, but uh, you all are here, and you know I'm pretty impressed with the audience and all the amazing things that are happening. Raise your hand if you used partial fraction decomposition this week. <laughs> okay, keep your hand up if you used it to solve an important problem that our society faces. <laughs> and so I just want to highlight that our curriculum fails to give the students the tools that they need to really engage with problems that matter. So as an educator, I'm trying to think about how do we reimagine the curriculum so that our curriculum actually centers problems that matter, matter to young people, and matter to our society. So as a curriculum writer, I'm thinking about what are these essential questions that can bring quantitative tools to our students? So I want to give you a few examples from my class and some work that I'm doing with the Launch Years Committee. Right now, I mean, just look out the window here, you see many electric vehicles. Our country is electrifying the U.S. auto fleet. And it's a, it's a call. It's a call to think about how to reduce CO2 emission. And I think there's a, a real importance to this, right? But there's also an incredible quantitative question. What does electrifying the U.S. auto fleet mean in terms of reducing CO2 emission? What does reducing that CO2 emission mean in terms of fighting global climate change? And, I think there are some really important quantitative tools that students need to unpack this type of work. But they're not being centered in our math classes today. But they could be. So I'm really inspired by the work happening here in Utah. I think that the data science pilot represents something really exciting and a lot of great energy. I'm also on this launch years committee where we're thinking about what happens in that transition space between secondary in early college years. And for me, it's about getting more rigorous with our mathematical thinking. And here's how I'm going to define rigor. Rigor is about better understanding our world. And I think so few students see the mathematics class as rigorous in that way. But they could. And I think the data science pilot is an example of this happening. So I'm really excited to introduce Lindy Hender Lindsay Henderson, um, the math specialist at the Utah State Board of Education who's going to be running the next panel. This data science pilot represents 17 different schools and tonight we're going to hear from teachers involved and students. And Lindsay, we're really excited to hear. Thanks so much, Brendan. I'm thrilled to be here today with all of you to celebrate the amazing work that our 18 innovative educators in the state of Utah, I put out a call to action, said, would anybody be interested in teaching a third or fourth year math course called Introduction to Data Science, where we center problem solving, communication, grappling with data, and rich data experiences? And I had 18 amazing teachers who took me up on this opportunity. And some of them are here today. And I'd like the educators that are participating in the data science pilot, could you stand up? These are wonderful people, innovators in the state. Thank you. And I'd like to invite a couple of the teachers and um, a district math level specialist up to, the, up to answer a few questions about your experience. I'm joined by Tyler, Ashley, hello, and Nicole. Come on up. Does everybody have a green light on their mic? We'll pass it down. All right. Let's start by making introductions. Tell us your name, what you teach, where you teach, and um, what interested you in the data science pilot? All right, I'll start. I'm Ashley Salisbury. I teach at Syracuse High in Davis School District. And I was excited because I love, I teach the AP statistics and just absolutely love it. So when I heard I could teach more along that lines, I jumped right on it and was excited that hopefully I could offer it to maybe students who didn't want the AP level. 
I am Tyler Haslam. I teach at Granger High School. Um, I forgot the, what was the second part of the question. Tell us why you were interested in joining the pilot. Oh, Tyler. the data set. Yeah. So, um, as a football coach, I use data science a lot. Uh, we're always analyzing opponents and stuff. And when we do accreditation, um, I was kind of the data guy, and they'd come to me and ask for insights and. That's kind of how I got started down that path. Um, and I actually was toying with the idea of taking a class that I taught called Math Decision Making, which has a big statistics component of it and sort of turning it into a data science class. Um, but that was very slow going because being a football coach and a track coach and a teacher, like I was doing like one lesson per year transitioning and it was never going to happen. So then when I heard about the data science pilot, I was like, ah, oh, this is right up my alley. So I was very glad to join. My name is Nicole Berg, and I work in Nebo School District. I'm one of our secondary math specialists, and this year I have the unique privilege to teach part-time as well. So I'm at Salem Hills High School teaching Math 3, and I'm super jealous of the teachers in my district that are teaching data science. Um, I first heard about data science when I listened to a podcast with Steve Levitt, and then Lindsay invited me and another math specialist to be part of writing data science micro-credentials for teachers at our state, and then part of launching Intro to Data Science with our teachers. So I'm super excited to be here tonight with all of you. Thank you so much for sharing. I love all the connections everybody's making to like these cross-curricular opportunities that exist with data as kind of the common denominator. I heard football, statistics, I, I really see data science as like the middle of the Venn diagram of all of the content area expertise that we have. Um, I wonder if you would share with us a little bit about what you hope the students in your classroom or the students in your district will take away from a data science class. Okay. Um, I hope that they get a little bit of experience of what those in the industry experience so they have a little bit of an idea of what occurs outside of the math classroom. Um, but I also just hope they become a little bit more data wise. There's so much data in the world and it's being thrown at them in social media and I just hope to make them a little bit more aware to be more careful consumers of all the information they see. Yeah, I echo that. Uh, the data literacy is definitely way more important now than it ever has been, I think. And, um, not just that, but the opportunity. So Granger's a Title I school. Um, our dynamic is, you know, one that I don't really necessarily know that many of our students go on to do things with the math that we teach them. And I think that this data science kind of offers a, a door for them to go do things that maybe they never thought they could. And I hope that that ends up being something. And I just want to piggyback off the fact that we want these students to be literate, right? And part of being literate is being data literate. Um, so I hope they walk away with that. I also think we've talked about, you know, different career paths in data science, and I think that's very important. But also their, their data surrounds us, big data surrounds us, more than ever has in the past. But data about ourselves is also present and so if we can look at it as a global have that global view but also that personal view i think students will walk away much better prepared um, to engage in the world around them but also to engage with themselves i i've made a lot of connections to what you've shared such as like well something that really resonated with me was seeing the opportunity to give students a skill that they see as valuable and empowering and I just think that's so important to highlight. And I feel like the data science experience, the things that you're teaching, the, the opportunities you're providing in your district bring that. Um, did you feel like you had the skills to teach this content prior to joining the pilot? Uh, a lot of, when we say the C word, code, that's a little scary sometimes to teachers, and particularly math teachers. And so I wonder how you, how you approach that. Why, why, why weren't you scared away? I've been doing it for a while, so that wasn't a problem for me. But I, I have colleagues that they were a little nervous about it, and I you know, kept telling them, like, it's going to be okay. It's, it's just like using your calculator, except it's a much more powerful one. So hopefully that sunk in. The, the statistics, kind of that aspect, um, I felt very comfortable with and was excited about. But yeah, the coding made me a little nervous. My husband's really good at it, though, so he promised he'd help me. So. 
That's great. He helps me with my homework when I come home at night. <laughs> <laughs> I think I speak for the teachers in my district. It's it, it's a broad range, right? Some of them were more prepared than others, and we're just diving in full force ahead. So, that's great. Can you describe what the what kind of training you received in order to? Um, I know you chose a curriculum. You each chose a curriculum to teach the data science standards through. And I wonder what the training experience was like and if you felt like it gave you the skills that you needed to be confident in the classroom to translate those data science skills to your students. Um, the, I did a week-long Zoom training this summer for our, the curriculum I selected and it was really good. I walked away feeling like I was ready and had some idea of where to start, but I've also been very grateful for all of their continued training. I've been assigned like a professional teacher by the organization who constantly reaches out and is willing to Zoom and has been really good to help answer questions. Ashley, did you learn a specific coding language? Um, we're, we're learning Pirate. Amazing. Okay. Tyler, what about your experience? Um, well, first, I think the background teaching statistics, that definitely helped. Like. I felt like I was kind of launched into it. Um, but then uh, Course Cut, I did, uh, shoot, I think it was like a month long, um, like meeting once a week. And we just kind of went through the course. So that was kind of like reassuring, like, OK, this is all stuff that we can handle, that the kids will be OK with. Um, and then they have, uh, I guess you'd call them like PLC meetings through Zoom. Like, uh, in fact, they have office hours, too, every day. And I've actually had to call in. and get some input from them, so that's been useful. Um, so yeah, I feel very prepared. Amazing, can you talk about the coding language that you're learning to teach? Uh, so Course Cutta uses R, which I hadn't used R before. I'm a Python guy and SQL and I like Excel, but, um, but yeah, so R was a nice, you know, change of pace and an opportunity to learn some new stuff. And Course Cutta, they also, they have some packages that you can download that kind of streamline some of the coding so you don't have to do as much syntax and that was kind of nice too. That's great. Nicole, can you speak for the teachers in your district? What, how did they feel about choosing a curriculum and learning potential scary code to <laughs> teach to their students? They're all sitting in the back. <laughs> um, I, like I said, I think um, for maybe one of them, coding came more natural and the others are learning and hopefully they find this a valuable experience. They're all super excited about it and the potential that it has for our students. And I think that's the best, the best that we can ask for them. So Nicole has a really unique opportunity in her district in Nebo. She has a pair of co-teachers and if you're in education, you know what that means, but for everybody else, I'll explain. So students with disabilities get access to a general education math course. We have lots of research that shows if a student is in a math class that's harder than they can actually grapple with and they're around peers that they can um, make sense of the world mathematically through, that they have better outcomes. And so we're huge fans of co-teaching in the state of Utah. And so that's when you pair a special education, education teacher with a regular education teacher, a general education teacher, and you mix the students as well. And they all have a, the, the class together. And Nicole, you have a pair of teachers that are teaching the Introduction to Data Science class in a co-taught classroom, which is amazing. Yes, I, I would agree. I also know, so we have that co-taught classroom, but in some of the other classrooms, we have students, there's a varied level, we have students that are taking calculus. So some of those that we would say, you know, are very high and have a great mathematical ability, and some of those who maybe have IEPs right in the same class and accessing, it's a, it creates a very level playing field um, for students in the math world. I so. love this, I love this. Um, so a, a huge question that's kind of out there in the ether in the, the data science world. So math already has data science, it's called statistics, yes. don't they? <laughs> What's different? What makes data science a different type of math class? That's a good question. When you know, let me know. Um, <laughs> no, I think, um, Scale is one thing for sure, like data science. When I think of data science, I'm thinking like our society is inundated with data all the time and what do we do with it? Like there's so much, it's just, yeah. Um, so I think there's that aspect. Um, I think because of that, the coding comes into play because you need the tools to attack the large amounts of data. Um, also the techniques, I feel like data science is probably more about 
modeling and predicting, whereas statistics is kind of more, uh, well, I guess that's about modeling too, but maybe the, the hypothesis testing, like you think of your AP stats course, it's, you know, no hypothesis, alternative hypothesis, find the p-value, and you just kind of do that through different iterations. Um, and not that you don't do that in data science, but I think it's more, um, that concept is more a tool that's applied to gain understanding. And I guess in stats it is too. But again, the understanding is, you know, now what can I do in the real world to make a difference based on the information I gain from this data? Yeah, in my AP stats class, we're definitely a lot more theoretical, like you said, where the data science is a little bit more, okay, here is the full data set, what can we do with it? Awesome. I hear, um, this is the kind of math class I would have loved to take in high school in particular, well probably even earlier, right, to capitalize on my interest, because it sounds like you're using a data as a tool to motivate students to question and reason and sense make mathematically. What a valuable tool. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had mathematical tools that were useful in everyday experiences and our everyday life? Um, Tyler, Ashley, you are math teachers by training. What makes the data science course different than say a secondary math one, two, or three, or AP statistics or AP calculus course? I like that I don't get the question, when am I gonna use this? Because every day they're seeing kind of just the immediate application of it. For sure. Um, in fact, I'm thinking right now, if I was teaching the math three, um, we'd be talking about how polynomials are analogous to the <laughs> integers, which I love Euclidean domains, and I could go off on that for, in fact, it's a common thread throughout the first semester because you then talk about rational functions and how they're analogous to the rational, anyway. Um, but yeah, no kid in high school is interested in that, um, and they probably think I'm nuts when I get excited about it, but um, being able to see where the rubber meets the road and in fact, I was reading an article from something you posted that had a link that had a link that eventually took me somewhere where they talked about um, the importance of teaching math through problem solving, like not problem solving like story problem problem solving, but problem solving like here's a real world application um, and places, places like Wright University, UCLA, um, they've all found that this is the golden ticket to helping kids gain access to this very abstract topic you need to make it, you know, something that they can have in their hands in front of them. And I think data science lends itself to that more than polynomials and whatnot, so. I mean, I get really excited about polynomials, but I also have we're, a map. We're weird, though. We're weird. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, it's for a small portion of the population. Nicole, what do, you hope, what do you hope as a district leader and also as a teacher in your classroom, I know you're not teaching the data science class, but what do you hope as a district leader that the students in your district, why, why is data science important for the students in Nebo School District? I think it's so applicable to their lives. When you think about the percentage of students that are, that really are going to take math three and then go into a STEM field, that's a, that's a smaller percentage, right? But data science opens up this world and the possibilities of what math is. So my goal as a district leader is to open that up and to have more students engage in data science. Um, and I think the key to that is having great teachers that we have that are teaching our students. Our students that are engaged in these courses are gonna be the best advertisement that we have to get more students engaged. So that's, that's my goal is that we open it up and we open up this pathway for students to be able to engage in mathematics. I love that, it speaks to exponential growth, right? You yes. train, we have one <laughs> cohort of students, then we get yeah. more, and then we, get, we double, double, double. Um, a question, do you, how did you, so this is a new math course, and I know when I was in uh, the classroom in a high school, um, advertising a new math course was kind of like, uh, I don't know, it, it was, yay, come do more math, and the kids were like, oh my God, who is this crazy lady who likes math? How did you get your students interested in enrolling in a data science course? Tyler, I know you in particular have several sections. You're kind of an outlier, if yeah. I can use a math term, in our data science teaching cohort? So we have seven sections at Granger, which is a lot. That's like all I can handle. Um, 
and it actually it's because our school is huge we have 3,500 kids and like 800 ninth grade well I guess they're 10th graders now no they're 11th graders um, yeah so all we really did is we offered them the choice we said here's math 3 and we talked a little bit about what math 3 is and here's data science <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't mention Euclidean domains so there's no did there's you no bias mention there. rational functions um, and polynomials we, we might have yeah no but we we actually hit it up as you know math 3 is your track to calculus data science is your track to statistics and not that you're picking a side and staying there forever, but that, you know, the emphasis is pointing you one direction or the other. And, um, yeah, it was about one in five, one in four students chose the data science. And uh, we did a lot of looking into the numbers because I was, well, I was worried because I was teaching it, but I'm sure the counselors were worried too, like, is this going to be... You know, in high school, there's always the dumping ground for the kids who need to make up credit, or there's the, you know, the honors class where we're shutting kids out. And um, so we pulled some test scores. Um, I don't remember what the test is called these days. Is it Aspire? The Aspire Not, Plus. Is it Aspire, Aspire Plus, yes. Because um, I don't do that. I have juniors, so we do the ACT. But um, we looked at their scores, and it was reassuring to see that it was just a broad spectrum of scores it wasn't like you know clustered in any one particular spot it was very representative and I feel like that is um, probably the best we could hope for because there's data and studies that show that you know a heterogeneous class does better than the homogeneous class so wonderful how about you Ashley what tell us your experience I had a little harder time recruiting <laughs> I have one small section, but we're hanging in there and having fun. Um, there was just a little bit of, I had a hard time communicating what data science was to administrators and counselors, and they kept thinking it should be in the science department, because science is in the name and not the math department. And anyway, so it's a work on progress this year to help educate everyone at our school what data science is. It really is. Um, tell me a little bit. Nicole, I'd like to hear from you. Have you do you have, know about how the, can you speak to the students that are in your data science program? Like, what are their experiences in your data science classes so far? We've only been in yes. school for what, three weeks, four yeah, weeks? Yeah, about four weeks. But so far, what is their experience? So, um, I actually spoke to my teachers because I wanted feedback before I got up here, right? And some of the coolest things is that they're looking at data right now that has something directly to do with them. It's their first unit, and so they come up with a question, and they gather data, and then they look at what story it tells, but one of the coolest things is that it often spurs other questions, and so they get super engaged, like, oh, well, what about this, and what about these types of things? So they're, they're learning to be engaged and look at stories and ask questions and, and learning a lot about how to represent that data. What does that look like? And more than just the typical like histogram or something, like data can be creative and I can represent it in many different ways. So that's where they're at right now. I love hearing this. Tyler, Ashley, how about student experience in your class? What are you hearing? You're hearing we want more polynomials? We want more <laughs> partial fraction decomposition? Uh, no. no. <laughs> No, they're having a good time. Um, in fact, we just did this activity with, we built these little catapults and we launched them to get some data and everyone had a blast. Um, but yeah, I do, I get a lot of feedback from kids saying that they're enjoying it. Uh, they think it's a great time. Maybe it's because they're not doing that other stuff and their friends are doing it and they compare homework and like, uh, that's disgusting. But no, it's, I, I think they see the application of it and we, we kind of hit it up big the first week, like this is why this is such a good class to be in because of the environment we're in right now with data. Um, and I think they, students can sense, right? And they, they know that Math 3 is funneling them to something they're probably never gonna do. And they also know that data science is opening up some doors for them. So I think they, they pick up on that. Anything you'd like to add, Ashley? Uh, one fun kind of experience I've had, I have a student in there who's a senior. I taught him last year in secondary math three and it was definitely not his class. He was lucky to pass most terms. Um, but it's been fun to see in data science, he is engaged, he's loving it. Like 
it turns everything in, top scores. It, it seems to be a fresh start for him. It, it doesn't have any background knowledge. He's not like missing gaps from years of prior math classes. He's able to just jump in and enjoy the course and is doing really well and kind of leads the class. That's amazing. So. A couple of things that stood out to me from what you described was a student who wasn't successful in secondary math three chose to take another year of mathematics. I think, I think he probably needed some math credit. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. And that you had the data science opportunity and now it's it really honors that idea that math is a, a web of ideas. It is not a linear trajectory and how people can be really competent in this part of the web and it the other part of the web is really difficult and it's so important to offer students a lot of different choice and opportunity mathematically to, to reach their mathematical goals. Um, I wondered if you could tell me what are you, so let's pretend it's April, it's, we're wrapping up the school year, your data science course is, is wrapping up, what are your plans, what are your next steps, your hopes for next year, for 24-25? I'd like to have a few more students in a few more sections. <laughs> That's my hope. I'd like to have a few less students in a few less <laughs> No, really. I'd like to share the load, maybe. That's the next thing, is getting people on board. And actually, you mentioned the code talk class. Um, I was co-teaching Math 3 for like the last five years. And we were toying with the idea of co-teaching the data science. And we kind of chickened out. I chickened out, really, when it came down to it. I was like, I don't know if I can handle all that. Um, I should have gone with it though, because then I'd have a, a buddy, but um, yeah, I'm still trying to think of what I'm going to do next month, so get back with me in April, but. <laughs> Wonderful. How about you, Nicole? Um, obviously, it's to have more courses offered. I, one of the things that I love about teaching is collaborating with others. I think that's super powerful, and so when we can get our teachers to collaborate, I know they're planning next Monday to come together. Some of them are using different curricula come together and talk about what they like, the pros and the cons, but I would love to get more students involved and more teachers involved in that, so. That's great. I know we have a lot of um, wonderful audience members that also double as parents of students in public education and in high schools. This is a wonderful opportunity that's available and could be at your high school. On the back of your, there's a QR code. I don't know if you noticed. If you scan that, that takes you to details about the specific data science pilot course that these three amazing teachers are participating in. If you want more information, um, be happy to con you can contact me and I'd be happy to share any more details that I have with you. Uh, I'd really like to thank the teachers, Ashley, Tyler, Nicole, all the teachers that are in the audience. Um, and I want to transition now to inviting some students in some of these classes to come up and share their experience. So if you wouldn't mind giving these three amazing individuals a round of applause. <laughs> and we'll invite the students up. Welcome, thank you so much. I tried, I have a senior, a daughter who's a senior, and I tried to bribe her to come tonight, and she told me to um, hit the road. <laughs> so thank you for being here, I really appreciate your time. <laughs> Would you mind telling us your name, where you go to school, and I don't know, tell us a fun fact about yourself. Um, hey guys, my name is Miles. I'm a senior representing Ranger High this year, and believe it or not, my name is Miles. Yeah. I think that's some cool stuff. Um, my name is Lona Manas. I am a senior, and I also attend Granger High School. And um, a cool fact about me, I'll be the first to attend college in my family, as well as being a first gen, so. Well, thank you again. And I'm assuming that your teacher is Mr. Haslam here? Of course. Yes, <laughs> wonderful. Two of the 300. Two, <laughs> two of the 300. <laughs> wonderful, <Okay>. wonderful. <laughs> so could you tell us a little bit about how, how did you discover that data science class was an option and what interested you? Why did you want to take, in, in, in Utah, you only need three years of math to graduate high school and you are seniors, so this will be your fourth year and there aren't a whole lot of people that elect to take another math class. So tell us a little bit about why you chose data science. 
Well, for me, I think the math teachers were just a little bit confused or maybe even a little bit jealous. I've got to admit this data science class seemed pretty nice, but I don't think they quite got it. Yeah, they were telling me I was gonna push the numbers on that TI-84 calculator and do some Python coding, and I thought, I don't know, maybe I should look a little more in depth, and here I am today. Yeah, got interested in it, I'm here with him. Wonderful. Um, honestly, I'm one of those students who needed the math credit. Um, I saw data science on my selections when I was selecting my courses. Um, obviously, you see stats, you see calc, um, and I was scared. I was like, I don't know if I want to get into that. So I was like, hmm, data science kind of seems interesting, and I hadn't seen it before because obviously it's new this year. So I was like, why not try it? And um, that's how I kind of got into it. So. Awesome. So tell us, it's been, what, four and a half weeks of school so far, roughly? How is your data science class? How are, what, how are your feelings about math this year? Okay, so far, this is literally the coolest class I have ever took. I'm being serious with you. The thing I liked is the Canvas implementation so far. The course kata in course instruction is literally the best. It is open-ended, and it's been one. I don't know, 12 school days for me, and I've completed this four year class about 38% of the way through. And I'll admit, it's pretty comprehensive. That's amazing. Tell us about your experience. Um, honestly, it's been great. When I first entered the class and Coach Haslam started explaining things, I was like, I think I'm going to go to my counselor and um, change out of my class, yeah. you know? Um, but what kind of led me to stay was how, enthousi how enthusiastic he was about the data science field. And he was just really describing it and even talking about personal experiences. So it kind of made me interested um, because you don't really see that with other courses. And so I was like, you know what? I'm trying to be cool like Mr. Haslam, so I'm gonna stay. It's amazing. Um, will you talk about maybe seeing the data science courses a little bit scary? Um, what was it that scared, that made you a little trepidatious about taking a, the data science course? For teachers, the thing that I hear the most often that makes people scared is the coding. What would, what's from the student perspective? Well, for me, I have an existing tech background and I thought, oh no, I'd open Pandora's box in class and I'd get all the students confused. That's it for me, you know. I love it, I love it. Honestly, I don't have a tech background like he does. Um, I didn't know what I was getting into when I signed up for the data science class. Um, just like Ashley had said, um, when she had introduced the um, data science class, they had thought it should be in the science area just because it had the word science in it. So I was like, oh, maybe it has something to do with science. I'm pretty good at science. Um, but when I got in there and I heard code, I was like, oh, goodness. I was like, I don't know if I can do this, you know? But um, the further we got into it, I was like, you know what? It's, it's some pretty cool stuff. And um, I just feel like words can be deceiving at some times. Um, and as we all know the phrase, you never know if you don't try, so. I love that. The course kata curriculum that um, Mr. Hassam chose is R heavy and Jupyter Notebooks. And those are tools that industry uses. Not, it's not a tool that's given to students to kind of scaffold them to coding. It is a real industry specific tool that both of these students are using. And I love to hear the confidence and how it's, it's not scary. That's great. That is so great to hear. So I wondered if, um, would, would you recommend this course to, let's say there's a junior next year asking you, what math course should I take as a senior? Or should I take a math course as a senior? Would you recommend this course? Why, why not? So if you're a student going to school, I'm gonna tell you to go take data science. Let me real with you here. I would say it is a comprehensive leap into the big world of data science. And it's something that's critical to life. It's as simple as I put it. Love it. Yeah. Um, I definitely would recommend it to other students, for sure. Um, at times when you're walking in the hallway and you're talking to your peers, you're like, oh, what class period are you going to next? And I say data science, they're like, what the heck is that? So, um, you know, that's where the curiosity stems from. And I feel like um, just 
youngins in general, um, we're definitely cur curious. Um, so I feel like with that curiosity, they'll have more of a passion to want to get into that class. So I definitely would recommend it. Um, I probably wouldn't tell them it's like code in the beginning because they're probably going to want to, you know, fly away from it. But um, I definitely would just tell them the basics and that it is a good class. I feel like we do have more easier math sections, like um, math making decisions. Um, I thought that's what data science was going to be, you know, just the easy way out. And I feel like as a senior or even a high school student, we always want the easy way out, you know? Um, and not saying that um, data, science, data science is hard or not hard, but um, it does challenge you in a way. So um, I like the fact that it gives us the space to, to grow, so. Oh, I love hearing the, all these wonderful reasons. I wanna go back to high school and take data science. It's never too late. <laughs> it's never too late. <laughs> I'm going to be the plus one in your course, Mr. Haskell. <laughs> My row is always empty, so you can come sit by me. I love this so much. I'm going to take you up on it. Uh, I wanted, Mr. Haslam, would you tell us uh, what is the most interesting thing that, I realize we're four weeks in, but what's the most inter interesting thing you have taught to these two amazing students and your other students in your classes so far? I don't know. What is the most interesting thing? Um, I, I remember this time, I don't know, it was a couple days ago, when we were aggressively optimizing these little gummy bear catapults. I tweaked a couple things, and when I went to test it out, it stuck on the ceiling, it stuck on the floor, it was going across the room. That was pretty fun. That was pretty fun. I definitely could agree. Um, it's more interesting, I feel like, as a student, when you have... Um, engaging things to do such as like launching gummy bears you know it's cool you know and then also you have that fact like i want to eat it too you know so <laughs> it's pretty cool honestly and um instead of just sitting in a class and just taking notes you know and like dozing off and not really paying attention we're more active and um it shows us just how great data science is so. i think one thing that i think is interesting is the you mentioned the jupyter notebooks and that was more scary to me than the code. Like, I've used Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, my brother-in-law's a, a code graduate from BYU, and so he's got me hooked on those years ago. But I thought, there's no way that I'm going to be able to do this with kids. But Course Cutter has a nice integration that makes it like you just click a button, you go to it. There's not a lot of dealing with the, the drive. And so the fact that we're able to get in that, you know, professional level tool or whatever you want to call it, like, I think that's pretty cool. Thanks so much for sharing. Okay, for our final question, I wondered what your interests are beyond, let's say it's April, you're graduating high school, you're on to bigger and better things. Has data science helped to open your mind to different opportunities or do you have other interests? What, what are your aspirations beyond high school? I feel like I have a very, very big field of view. I'm aware of how far I can improve myself. And with this, I went into this class thinking, hey, I could be a lot more well-rounded. <coughs> I think looking into the future, life is so fragile, yet it's pretty smooth, I'll say. We just don't know where that stream is going, and while data science is still in its infancy, we're here to figure that out. I love that. Um, in all honesty, I just want to say in general, I'm very grateful that I was able to take this data science class, especially for it being my last year in high school. Um, I know it's going to be very helpful and useful, and I do plan on sharing new information that I do learn with peers or just other people I meet in general and um, applying it to my daily life. Um, as students, or I, yeah, I'll just say as students, um, we utilize data science a lot, but we just don't realize it. And um, like one of the panelists has said earlier, with the, um, the Spotify charts, stuff like that, I feel like it doesn't really click for us, um, but it's like, it's data science, you know? So um, putting it out in that light, I feel like will help students be interested more. And I feel like, not even feel like, I know data science is our future. And I feel that if, um, let's see, how would I put this? Um, yeah, data science is our future. So I feel like if students, um, 
see that it's progressing more and um, it's obviously being pushed more further into the future that students will become more interested in it um, because they see that it is our future and it's starting to progress so yeah thank you so much can I get a round of applause for these amazing students and just one more call for the educators who are participating wave your hand we want to recognize you and your amazing commitment to the schools that you serve thank you so much Thank you. Thank you so much to the teachers and students who spoke. I'm, I'm really inspired. I have two high school seniors myself. And um, for you students, you know, your opinion about this class is going to have more weight with other students in the future. So thank you so much for sharing here. And please continue to share in your own school about your experience. So let me talk about our final speaker for today we are thrilled to have representative jefferson moss who is a republican member of the utah house of representatives he has deep roots in utah both personally and professionally representative moss has a bachelor's and an mba from brigham young university and is a known entrepreneur currently serving as the executive director of the innovation district at the point Representative Moss is a staunch supporter of both education and creating robust job opportunities for Utah citizens, which brings us full circle back to where we started that we are wanting to create uh, the skills within our students so that they can bring the workforce of the future. So please help me in welcoming Representative Moss. Um, I really should just say, wow, that was amazing, and let's go home, because those students just knocked it out of the park. Um, that is the ex that's the stuff that we all get excited about, just so you know, watching these students just shine and, and, and get excited about this. Um, I also want to say how grateful I am to see this group. Um, educators, business people, higher education, um, all coming together to say, hey, there's a need here, and, and, and we can help provide that that service for these for these wonderful kids and help make sure that as a state we're continuing to move things forward um, as was mentioned I, I have a little background in education and so when when I hear these awesome pilot programs I actually was a member of the State Board of Education and, and this will sound a little crazy um, it was not even maybe eight years ago maybe nine years ago where we were discussing making computer science an elective and isn't that amazing how far we've come in, in Utah that, that, I, I don't, I'm trying to remember, Lindsay, was that about that long ago? It was when I was on the board. Um, so that, that tells you, you know, as a state, we've been, we've been doing our best to catch up, but th having programs like this, this pilot program, is really gonna help us uh, move to the next level. Um, interestingly, on the legislative side, um, we're still dealing with this, even with computer science in general. So um, I was uh, just coming off the board and moving into the legislature, um, when we were first looking at this uh, computer science initiative. And at the time, what was so cool about it, it was industry that came and said, we need people that understand these skills. We need workers. Like, we're all excited, we're growing, we have this incredible economy. We don't have enough people that have the skills to do this. And so these wonderful people came and said, we're even willing to put up funding to help match the state to help meet this need. And, and I had the benefit of being able to be part of those conversations. And so seeing that evolve and, and crazy, it was only this year that we finally got that as ongoing funding. And we have a number of places in the state where we're still not really doing basic computer science. And what a tragic thing that is that we have all these students that are not getting this access. So when I see these really cool innovative programs, it's just, it's really awesome to me to see. Um, part of my job is actually looking at innovation, right? I'm helping with the point of the mountain. Um, not on the land side, I'm specifically thinking around and working around how do we develop out more of an ecosystem supporting entrepreneurs. And as part of my job, I went all over the world and I'm like, I want to find the best places in the world that are doing innovation. And it was the funniest thing because I'd go to these places, Kendall Square and you know RTP in, in North Carolina, Mission Bay, and I was over in Israel and Dubai and just really trying to understand. Every time I'd walk in, they'd say, why are you here? We want to learn from you. Utah is doing this so well. <laughs> and I just thought, wow, that's so cool to hear that, that people understand that. But there are things that we can do better. And, and uh, you know, one of the things I did learn about when I was at Kendall Square 
is they said, you know, our big thing right now is life sciences, but it wasn't always life science. We actually were a mainframe state, and it was some leaders that proactively said, we've got to get out in front of another industry that we can really build out. And so they really went in big on, on life sciences. And one of the first things they did is focused on that workforce training. How do we get these kids from K-12 all the way up through higher education that are getting prepared to meet what we think is the next wave of innovation? And you look at Kendall Square today and you think, well, that's amazing. How did they get there? It all started with workforce and, and getting these kids these awesome opportunities. And, and not just when they hit college, in these, these earlier years um, where these wonderful students are, are able to learn from. Um, I guess I'd just take it a little bit further than that and saying, where are we going as a state? Um, you know, we've done amazing things. The state's doing awesome things. Our school board is doing amazing things. Our staff is doing amazing things. But we can't sit back and say, oh, we've done it. We've got to really be thinking, where is the next 10 and 20 years? How do we make sure that Utah continues to thrive and be the leader in a lot of these places? If we don't get out in front of data science, we are not going to be there. Data science is in everything, as you all know. Um, I, I've been on this working group around AI and, and, and looking at the, the workforce and where the, where the world is changing. Every single industry is looking at data science and AI. And if you don't embrace it, we're not going to be able to compete. Um, and so that's one thing I'm, I'm super excited about is how do we continue to develop out and support these wonderful programs. Um, I guess I'll just end. I don't have a lot more to say other than um, when I look at everything that's happening around the world, a lot of other states and other countries are putting a lot of resources behind this and finding ways to really invest. And, and I'm concerned if we don't continue to support our wonderful uh, students that we may not be able to compete as we move forward. So that's one thing that I'll be very focused on as, we, as we're moving forward. Finally, I just want to say thank you to these wonderful teachers that are here. Um, my wife is a teacher and I know, especially over the last couple years, watching the, the challenges that they've gone through, um, I, 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 I always say the best lobbyist is when you're married to a teacher because I get to hear every single night all the things that they're working through and the challenges that they face and I just deeply, deeply appreciate those of you here that are, that are involved in helping teach these wonderful kids. And, um, that's all I had for you today, so thank you for your time. I'm happy to take questions if anybody wants, but, but thank you for letting me have an opportunity to speak to you. Yeah, I guess we do have a question. That is a very good question. For those that didn't hear, she was asking, how do we get these students connected in as they're coming out of high school and wanting to get into industry? And for a teacher, it is hard to go out and try to get that. Um, one of the things that the state of Utah has really been doing, I think, really well, and is growing, and I think um, clearly we need to do even more, but um, this group called Talent Ready, and the whole idea was how do we bring the workforce to our schools? And so they've been doing a number of things around internships. Last year I ran a bill directly around apprenticeships. And the whole concept is getting students, even in K-12, while they're in their junior and senior year, direct hands-on experience that actually could be stackable as they, want, as they go into higher education if they want to pursue that. But those are the kind of things. So I, I would say the Talent Ready internship is one really good opportunity um, that, that I would encourage um, some, some engagement on. Uh, but beyond that, I, I, I think working with your local community, I don't know what district are you in? In Granite, okay, great. Um, yeah, that's a really good question of how do we, how do we be more encompassing? Yeah, and I think that was the idea of Talent Ready is really trying to reach down. So Talent Ready actually sits inside the higher education, but a lot of the programs and things that they're doing are actually directly tied into K-12 and trying to get these students. So I know that there's efforts being made, but we definitely need to continue to do that. And maybe it's partly just making sure that information is being shared and, and getting that out through our school. So I think that's a great, uh, great comment. Any other questions? I know I didn't know if I could do question and answer, but I'm happy to do it. Any other questions? Well, thank you again. Thank you for all the things you're doing, and I appreciate this great program. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Representative Moss. Thank you, all of the speakers. Thank, thank you to all of you attending. And I want to thank the collaborators for this fantastic event, both DOMA Women Tech Council, Utah Tech Leads, and Data Science for Everyone. And I just want to leave you with a, a final thought and a call to action. I started by telling you I'm in marketing. And um, I would say I am not a data scientist, but I am data literate. And to do a job that has nothing to do with math or science, you still have to have data literacy and a, and a comfort with it. And I have to say, um, after I graduated from college with communication major and lit writing minor, numbers scared me. At that time, I don't even know how many years ago that was, I chose to get an MBA because I felt like that's what I have to do in order to tackle this thing that scares me. I don't want our students today to have to get an MBA to tackle the thing that might scare them should it be anything numbers. And I'm just here to say, whatever industry you're in, you have to have the data literacy. So it's, it's, it's wonderful for people to be, come up as actual data scientists, but also data literacy for people who are in every other kind of you know, art is so critical. And so I want to leave you with a call to action. Just in the next couple days, I want you to notice the world around you and where data shows up and where, when you think about it that way, what new questions pop in your mind? What new curiosity comes up because you might be able to answer a data question? And when you have the answer to the data question, what deeper questions does that lead to? And it's this culture of curiosity that data literacy and data science can really open up for our students. And so I want to just invite you to all kind of bring that accessibility to this topic to the people around you, whether it's students or teachers or policymakers. And thank you for being on this journey together. And please make sure to keep digging into it by following these par partner organizations of Women Tech Council, Utah Tech Leads, and Data Science for Everyone. And thank you again so much. Let's just have a round of applause for this fantastic event. <laughs> Have a great rest of the evening.